Chair Manchin, thank you. Thanks for holding this hearing as well. Uh, the future of hydrogen energy is exceptionally important for us to be able to address here and to be able to talk through it. I am uh, honored to be able to sit in for uh, Ranking Member Barrasso and, uh, and join you and our family praying for Bobby and uh, for her quick recovery. Hydrogen is one of the simplest and most commonly occurring elements on Earth. The reason we're here discussing it today is it burns cleanly with the byproducts being heat and water. Hydrogen has many potential uses. One of the most talked about possible uses for hydrogen is in the transportation sector and as a power, especially for heavy trucks. NASA has been using hydrogen fuel since the 1950s to power rockets into space. It's, uh, they were one of the first to use hydrogen fuel cells to support the electrical system on spacecraft. It's time that we learn from their experience and their applied lessons to solve transportation and heavy industry challenges here on Earth. Despite the promise of hydrogen, there are some challenges in unleashing its potential. Hydrogen has to be freed from compounds it commonly occurs in, like water, H2O, and methane, CH4, to get it into a state where it can be used as an energy source. The process to separate the elements requires significant power itself. The process to uh, continue this process, whether we put it into a liquid form, requires a tremendous amount of power to be able to keep it that cold. Hydrogen also doesn't produce as many BTUs as methane does. But beyond production challenges, there are many logistical questions that need to be answered as to the use of this technology and how it grows. One such question is how to best transport hydrogen from where it's produced to where it'll be used. Our existing natural gas pipeline networks holds promise for transporting and delivering hydrogen across the country and provides an incredible example of how we can leverage existing infrastructure to meet the future needs rather than starting from scratch. But the natural gas pipeline uh, infrastructure has developed over decades. To have this kind of infrastructure available for future hydrogen, we need to make investments now. Unfortunately, investment in natural gas pipelines all too frequently is met with opposition, despite natural gas playing a key role in lowering emissions, despite the critical roles pipelines may play in empowering a broad adoption of low and no emission hydrogen. Their efforts are already, already underway to grapple with how to best produce and deploy this resource of hydrogen. I'm particularly proud of my home state of Oklahoma's efforts to grow the hydrogen industry. In the spirit of its long hin history of being an energy leader and having a very diverse energy economy, my state put together a task force to determine how it can use its deep experience in the energy industry to pioneer the hydrogen frontier. The report of the task force is released last year, outlined a roadmap for how we can combine our existing resources like abundant natural gas and renewable power with our energy expertise to grow the hydrogen economy. I'm glad we have witnesses here today who are familiar with this effort, and I'm always glad to be able to see some Oklahomans here as well. Although there are states and regions that have the building blocks for the hydrogen industry, its growth and broad success is far from guaranteed. Government policies, unfortunately, sometimes unfairly or unintentionally prevent technologies that should be winners from floating to the top. I'm concerned about the conversation around green versus blue hydrogen will pit technologies against each other rather than working together to establish a robust hydrogen marketplace. The simple truth right now is 95% of hydrogen produced in the United States is made from natural gas. If our goal is to determine whether hydrogen is a viable alternative to some of our existing energy technologies, we cannot discount a method that could drive the need for and development of other parts of the supply chain. We really need an all the above approach to give this effort the best chance of success, and I'm hoping this is a topic we'll discuss today. Finally, hydrogen provisions in last year's Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, including the $8 billion to stand up regional clean hydrogen hubs, have generated a lot of interest in many states represented on this committee. I look forward to hearing how the Department of Energy plans to spend this funding and how they define a hub. I'm always glad to see all of you here. I'm grateful for the time that you've spent actually writing and preparing for this time period and doing the research, and we look forward to the conversation. But, but, it's, a, but it's the same issue, really, to be able to, with ethanol, because yeah. hydrogen is, also does not burn as hot as methane does. Is that correct? So the British thermal units on methane is higher than it is for hydrogen, so same for gasoline and for ethanol. Correct. Your ethanol is not as fuel efficient as gasoline so we, is. So that, that's also a factor. Is, am I correct or not correct on that? Yes, uh, you're correct. Doctor, Dr. Shepman, side of Paul. Oh, yeah, no, thank you. Um, just to add, uh, you know, in agreement there, there are many studies ongoing. So in general, um, con 
consensus so far is maybe about 5 to 15 percent blends may be appropriate. Depends on the materials of the pipeline. You can have embrittlements and issues, and you're um, exactly right, the end use applications, the burners. There may be some modification. The UK is looking, in fact, at you know completely 100% um, hydrogen as uh, some of their pilots in uh, some cities were coordinating internationally. We also have uh, an initiative called High Blend. There are now over 40 companies, along with our um, other consortium, to look exactly at what types of materials should be used. Um, the, the flame is actually hotter with hydrogen. Um, but again, the, what I was going to mention is I was in Germany about four years ago, the world's largest at the time, wind to hydrogen plant. It was six megawatts. Now they're substantially larger. But, and they were injecting 10%. That was the blending limit. Uh, into the natural gas pipeline for three years. And so there were no issues. And so there, in terms of um, looking at our, our safety codes and standards subprogram, our R&D is really helping to inform the right codes and standards, having the right uh, injection standard, both in terms of the pipelines. And so we're working with um, DOT, the, the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety um, authority that regulates uh, safety of pipelines and uh, also you know, really informing what should those li limits be. So really appreciate that question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, Mr. Kraft. I, I know we're short on time, so I'll be very brief just to add to the comments. I think it's clear that there's a lot of effort underway, as has been said, to look at what you can blend in an existing pipeline system but you're going to be limited as to what you can do, 10% or whatever the case may be, and a lot of work is going on on that. I don't know whether that ends up. We operate some of those pipelines of pure hydrogen today, mm -hmm. and, and they are constructed with a totally different metallurgy. They are constructed with different types of fittings and different types of operations, and are really point to point for those that actually need that for a specific purpose so that you avoid some of these other issues. So I'd be happy to follow up on that. Another point is when you get to a very high purity, another port or part of use is not just the BTUs, but it's also the fact that hydrogen burns totally clean. You can't see it when it burns. And so you reach a point where fire eyes and other things no longer work. The final point I'll make is that we see the opportunity to build more localization of facilities so that you aren't having to ship across great distances. Because each ecosystem may have the availability, as we spoke of before, for renewable power to generate uh, hydrogen with electrolysis, to produce it with natural gas and capture the carbon. And you are able to reduce the transportation footprint and actually provide jobs in that locality that are very good jobs. Let me yeah. ask you, is, is there any experiments in basically blending hydrogen into uh, coal-fired units uh, in, in the boilers? We've been able to reduce the NOx in there. Can we do the same thing by inducing hydrogen to reduce the emissions? Anybody, do you know if we've done that? I don't think it's happened in the United States, but Japan is um, pursuing that. So Japan's pursuing adding uh, hydrogen into their coal-fired units? What they're, they're, the idea is, well, th what, they're, what they're testing is introducing ammonia as a hydrogen gotcha, carrier gotcha, into gotcha. the coal-fired okay. boiler. If you get, whenever you get any results, please pass them on. I, we'll I, look for them also. I do want to come back to Mr. Levinka on the on the regulatory side as well, and then I've got one other question just on distribution network, then we'll wrap it up. Is that all right? Yeah, go ahead. All right, let's do it. So the regulatory side, you were halfway through that question before the chairman appropriately interrupted. Uh, <laughs> but the, 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 the challenge that we have in this committee is trying to be able to determine what, what, are, the, what are the issues that are going to come at us that literally we've got to resolve around this dias if we're going to actually move forward on hydrogen. And I, my perception is if there's not clarity on the regulatory issue of who's handling the pipeline, who's permitting it, if we end up blending fuels like this, does that change the regulator on it? All of those issues that are out there that we need to know if there's something that y'all know at this point that we've got to deal with statutorily. Sure. Uh, great question, Senator. And so I, I would say we're asking those same questions now. And I think the regulators are trying to, to figure out where their scope starts and stops. Um, specifically, when we think about natural gas blending, um, we deal with FERC on a natural gas uh, on the NGA side of it. And so um, how much of a blend does that stop being a natural gas pipeline and start being a hydrogen pipeline? Who's going to regulate that? Those are questions that we're trying to get answered. Uh, we need that clarity to be confident in our investment and confident moving forward in these things. And so well, it, if at some point the regulators aren't clear on that, obviously we've got to make clarity on that to be able to provide statutory clarity and to be able to say you don't have to guess 
because that could change from administration to administration. That doesn't provide stability and in investment. We're not going to get capital coming to the market if people don't really know it, uh, where the investment is on this. My last comment was um, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, multiple different trucking uh, uh, companies basically that handle the fuel, uh, the trucking truck stops, they started investing into natural gas, getting into their spot. So when the transition happened for heavy vehicles, went to natural gas, they'd be ready to be able to sell fuel. Now, a lot of those have million dollar investments sitting at a station that's not used because the federal government was going to push towards natural gas for heavy trucking. I would assume those same truck stops are going to pause significantly before they start moving to hydrogen or electricity to charge batteries or whatever it may be because they just got, excuse the pun, burned 10 years ago by investing millions of dollars into what the federal government told them was happening and where it's going next. How do we avoid that same thing again? And how do we get those companies to say, okay, this is really the investment without basically the federal taxpayer doing that? Because that was private investment that did all the natural gas stuff. Now we're talking about either federal grants doing it and the taxpayer having to be able to pay for that yeah. mistake or something yeah. else. Yeah, or loans or whatever it may be. So how, how do we get to a point where there's some certainty in it so we don't have that same mistake again? <laughs> there's not much of an answer to that one because the federal government will either jump in. I, I've been pushing back on, I, I said this is simple, that I never recall reading the history books. The United States government built filling stations when Henry Ford invented the Model T. We just didn't do it. The market usually jumped in and did it. The market is skittish right now because yeah. of what they, that's what he's saying. We will, we will prime the pump. It'll be some very attractive low interest loans, no interest loans, trying to get these markets primed up. But it's, it's going to be a, a money source sooner or later. And, and the federal government and the taxpayer and the, and, and, the, and the treasury should not be left holding the bag. Great. But I'm willing to wait five or 10 years to get that back just at our cost. That's all. So I think that would be enough without you all putting your capital in jeopardy right now. That's what we're hoping will happen. Yeah, I would agree. I don't think the federal taxpayer should be involved in that. But that's yeah. that's one of those challenges out there. R&D is one thing. Distribution is in something entirely different. But we've got to win some folks over that are still ticked.